Charles Wright Museum, African American History, of course. You know, we are the largest museum in the country that has a permanent exhibition in our core, and still we rise. For those who haven't been, I really invite you to explore the deeper part of our museum, where history from Africa, where we have to start uh, through modern times, is really available to you. Dr. Wright, Dr. Charles Howard Wright, who was born in 1918, was a visionary. Yeah. He certainly, like many of you who are physicians, was focused on his craft. But that's the concern of himself. And of course, he brought into this world many babies, and he came to be very concerned about our youth, our children. And because he traveled to Africa and understood that we needed to develop a sense of confidence around education, to know our real history, to know our greatness out of Africa, as Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop documents in his book, Civilization of Barbarism, the fact that from the 18th to the 25th dynasty documents that Africans with dark pigments were the crafters of the pyramid, which has encoded in it the pi symbol, the high mathematical symbols that still stand today. That we tracked the sky for 26,000 years in order to build a calendar. The high architecture. It's not Greece, it's Africa. So we have a position who was focused on developing an educational system, starting in his home, doing tour buses, and eventually coming to this edifice, this space, sacred place, where we're focused on education. On education that you may not typically receive in traditional higher educational communities or institutions. Other individuals come to mind, such as Shea Gabar, another physician. Certainly could have stayed practicing medicine in Argentina, but he was concerned, like Dr. Wright, about others, about the community, about the world, and sacrificed his life to fight to free Cuba and others, and actually going into Congo. So here you have a medical doctor whose consciousness is prick. We think about Quince Benon, again, a psychiatrist from Martinique. Those who you may be familiar with Benon know he's the crafter of a master book. Black Skins, White Mass, The Wretched of the Earth. During his psychiatric work with the terrorists of the Algerian French War, he came to see that there was an unjust, injustice being perpetrated. So he became a revolutionary. So what we're asking you to do, those who can, is to not only be concerned about your own family and yourself in terms of individualism, but to realize that we're a collective people. So if you have the capabilities, this museum really needs the support of physicians and professionals in order to have more independence. Dr. Wright did not want this museum in the sense of having corporate sponsors. He thought in a predominantly black city that we would be members. How many are members here of the Charles Wright? Those who are not, it's very inexpensive. $15 for senior citizens, $35 for individuals. I'm asking you tonight to become a member of this institution. So we have a broader mission to just simply put it on programs. We want to be connected to this community and we've done so when we met with the Council of Elders. The Council of Elders, people such as Dr. Gloria House. I'd like to give her a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Gloria Amelia House, women of SNCC, who worked with Stokely Carmichael in the South to forge and pull forth voter registration, but who also achieved academic excellence to be chair and Director of Black Studies, African American Studies at University of Michigan, Dearborn, retired twice from Wayne State, and also University of Michigan, Dearborn. Did she sit down? No. She came to the community and said, there's a need in our community to broaden the educational opportunities for our children. We had a meeting. Frank Joyce was there, one of the first 
vice principal of Freedom School during the 1966 Northern High School walkout. Vincent Hardy, these are the type of people who said, you know, they're destroying our children. They're destroying our schools. What are we going to do? Out of our fight for self-determination, they came to the museum and said, can we have a freedom school here? Without question, absolutely. This is a school, an institution that belongs to the community. Now what does the freedom school represent? It's high level excellence. You have former professors teaching, current professors. These are not students. I went to a charter school. I took in a bag of books and put them on the table and had the, all the teachers come to the room. And I simply asked them questions. Are you familiar with Du Bois? Black Reconstruction, The Souls of Black Folk. Are you familiar with Ida B. Wells? I went through a litany of African American history. They had no clue. And if they don't know, they can't teach us. So we have to rely on ourselves. The Freedom School was part of that movement. We extended that further. You may see logos on the Freedom Schools that we developed. This is a Freedom School movement that started in the South, and we're continuing that movement. Brother Awusu Mular and others, elders, came and helped build a garden on these grounds. We have a garden for the children because we don't have a major grocery store in Detroit. You have to go to the outskirts. All the high sugar that you get at these stores. We have to teach ourselves on how to use any space we have to grow our own food. Self-independence. Helen Moore, one of the leaders of fighters of school systems here. Let's give Helen a hand. I want each of you to look in your heart and think about and actually do become a member of this museum, support it in a very high way in terms of your capability, not small dollars, large dollars. Think about those individuals like Dr. Wright, Che Guevara, France Benon. Each generation has a mission. You must fulfill it or betray it. Thank you.